your word. And Lord, your word is truth and life to those of us who find it. Anoint your word to every ear and every heart in this room. That your word might come alive to us. And that we might learn to use it when we need it the most in our lives. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen and amen. If you remember from two weeks ago, we started into Romans chapter 1. And a couple of things that we talked about was, uh, first of all, we talked about what the gospel of God was. If you remember in chapter in Romans chapter 1 verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. So we asked the question, what is the gospel of God? <clears throat> and what we, we, we understand what the gospel of God is, the gospel of God is obviously the good news, but it is the, that he died, that he died for me, that he was buried, and he rose again, if you remember from the discussion. That is the gospel of God. <clears throat> and that's important because the reason why he died for us was because he wanted to be able to marry his bride. That's why we see the wedding feast of the Lamb in the book of Revelation at the very end of the book. We are called to be in the brideship, a covenant relationship with God. And the reason why God needed to, that Jesus needed to die was because if, if you understand the law, you understand that, that in order for a wife to remarry after they've been divorced, then the husband has to die. Well, that's not true today, as we know. But in order for Christ to be able to marry his bride again, he had to die, he had to be buried, and then he rose again. And now he prepares us for the wedding feast of the Lamb. We come into that personal, intimate relationship with Christ. We know that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we know that if you were to read it in a Hebraic sense, you would realize that what God was doing was he was making a place, building a place for his son to marry his bride. And that wedding feast, that happens within us. So that's what the gospel of God is all about. And it says in verse 2, which has been promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is what was prophesied concerning his son, verse 3, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. <clears throat> and so you're seeing now that the, the reason, the whole reason for the gospel of God was that we are now looking for the bride and the brideship relationship with God. Now, it says in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He could remarry us again. By whom we have received, I'm just going to walk through chapter 1 and then we'll go back into chapter 2 a little more detail by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Verse 6, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you're going to see is number one, the main one of the main themes that runs through Romans is what is the gospel of God. Number two, it's grace. Paul is going to, over the next few chapters, lay out a case of what great how grace operates in our life. 
and how amazing grace is. <clears throat> and that our justification in our life is because of that grace that comes into our lives that we live by faith unto our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and he talks about Rome here, and this is not, and I remember we talked about this last time, when he mentions Rome, he's not talking about like the Roman church. These were the believers that were in Rome. That means these believers were believers that were scattered throughout the city of Rome and Paul had never met them. Paul had, at this point, never been to Rome. He talks about wanting to have come to Rome, but he had not been to Rome at this point. In fact, in Scripture, we don't even see Peter in Rome. We see Paul ending up in prison in Rome, where he writes many of his epistles. <clears throat> As we continue to go through just the, the background of chapter 1, and, and so we can begin chapter 2. Verse 8, for I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, anybody who's been around the church for a little while knows that one of the things that we've been talking about quite a lot is what is the biblical definition of faith. First of all, we know that faith is confidence. But the biblical definition of faith is believing those things that are not as if they were. And you can read about that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, if you want to go back, with the example of Abraham. He believed those things that are not as if they were. And so you can imagine that if the Roman uh, believers receiving this letter hearing from Paul saying that your faith is known throughout the world, that means that their faith, believing those things that are not, that means that they have the ability to trust and to believe in faith. <clears throat> and it's that kind of faith that God uses to change the world. <clears throat> Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Verse 10, making request if by any means now, at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. So he had desired to come to the believers in Rome. He wanted to bring them a, a gift he wanted to increase their faith. He wanted to bring a blessing to their, to their lives. For I long to see you, he said, that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, ye might be established. Verse 12, that is what, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was not let here unto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among the other Gentiles. The reason why Paul says that is because Paul was called the apostle to the Gentiles. <clears throat> What's interesting about being called the apostle to the Gentiles is he was trained under one of the greatest Jewish minds in Israel, Gamil. He was also trained in the finest schools in <clears throat> the Roman Empire. So Paul was probably, you know, uh, without knowing other people in that time, was probably one of the, was an extremely smart person, very well educated in his day. And I, when you read his epistles, you, you would read, you start to see that he had a desire even for the Jews. So when you see him say this, that he wants to see fruit among you even as among other Gentiles, what's important to Paul is that he has a fruitful life where God has called him to. Now in order to have a fruitful life, you have to be planting seeds. 
Fruit doesn't come just because you're sitting around waiting for something to happen. So you're going to see this theme throughout the book of Romans. He's going to, sh to talk to us not only about the grace of God that comes into our life and how grace works, but he's also going to be teaching us about faith and how we're to activate that faith. He talks about the work of faith in our life. Remember what the biblical definition of faith is. It's believing those things that are not as if they were. That means that you have to be able to begin to see outside the three-dimensional world that you live in. And the only way that can happen, just like when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, in order to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. That means divine revelation has to come into our lives. And we have to come into that bride, bridegroom relationship. Born again. That means that you, oh, you wake up and you begin to see there's more to life than meets the eye. That you're seeing beyond the three dimensions that we're used to seeing. So, believing those things that that are not as if they were. <clears throat> Verse 14, I am a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now, when it means debtor, it doesn't mean that he owes him money. It means that he has an obligation, that he is called and compelled with obligation to do what he's called to do. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Remember what the gospel is. That he died for you. Remember why he died for you. So that he could marry his bride. Remember what the law said. The law said that in order for a woman to remarry her husband, a husband, the, that her husband that she was married to, had to be dead. And then she could remarry. If she married him while she was yet alive, she would be committing adultery. And so, the gospel of God is so simple. It is that he died for you, that he was buried, and that he rose again. <clears throat> so, he wouldn't be ashamed when you know who you are in Christ, that you are coming into, you are, you are now in your life, he's come and he's married himself to you. And what does it mean to be married? It means that you become one. In the Hebrew scriptures, it talks about echad. It means a multiple. It's like a multiple of grapes that become one big grape. Or you get a thing of bananas and you have, you can have one banana, but you can have a you can buy a bunch of bananas. And so it's a multiple of one. So you and Christ become one. And that's what he longs for. That's what he's looking for. That's what the gospel of God is all about. That's why when you go, to your, when you go into baptism, what do you do? Your old self is, at the, uh, uh, is out above the water. You go into the waters and you leave your old self behind and you come out, what? A new creature in Christ. And it's not so much about going into the waters because you can go down a wet center and you can come back up a wet center. You can go down a dry center and come up a wet center. It's because now you identify yourself with Christ. You realize that Christ is in you. Not some God that's way out there or you're having to worship some idol uh, because of what it's going to do for you. No, Christ becomes a part of you. It says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is that he put eternity into the heart of man. And so the only way that you and I can begin to identify with Christ is that by faith, through grace, that's how salvation comes into our life. And he begins to mold and shape you into that bride, bridegroom relationship with your husband, with Christ himself, who is willing to die for you, 
He was willing to be buried. And miraculously, he rose again. That's why he's not ashamed. And that's why none of us should be ashamed of the gospel. Verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's a quote from Habakkuk. I believe it's chapter 4. It says, the just shall live by faith. How do you live today? If you're believing in faith, that means you're believing those things that are not as if they were. Then your life is based on believing those things that are not as if they were. That means that you have learned to live what I would call fourth dimensionally. You've now learned to live in the kingdom of God, which is above and throughout this entire world. That means that you're learning to live by faith. If you're not living by faith, then your whole existence is based on what this world can do for you, believing those things in your life that are material, and you live in faith, you're not living in the way that God has called you to live. That means you might be totally dependent on money or totally dependent on somebody making sure that they give you a pat on the back. We're all in that place because that's part of our human nature. But the exercise of faith is learning to live beyond that. So how do the just live? The word for just in Hebrew would be zadik. Okay? That means that that is a righteous person in righteousness. And if you go back to some of the teachings, you'll learn about more about righteousness and how righteousness works in our lives. <clears throat> but it's the righteous, the just, that God is building his entire work upon. In fact, it says in Scripture that, that it's upon the righteous that the whole world exists. The whole world is built upon that. And it's built upon the righteousness, truly the righteousness of Christ. Because when Christ lives in you, and you're living by faith, believing those things that are not as if they were, and you're living in that bride-bridegroom relationship, and you're living by the gospel, the good news, that what he did for you, now your life can begin to go from faith to faith. From glory to glory. As opposed to when no one, when you haven't had that born again experience, when you haven't seen the kingdom of God in your life, where you live totally by what you see, feel, and touch around you. That's why when, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he says, you are a wise man of Israel, a teacher of Israel. You don't know these things? <clears throat> When you have had that born-again experience and your inner eyes have been opened to the kingdom of God, he is now bringing us into that place in our lives where we truly learn to live by faith. We're bringing these up. We wanted to repeat this, number one, because we didn't have sound two weeks ago. But number two, I want to make sure that we understand this as we begin to unpack what Paul is talking about in the book of Romans. Because listen, verse 20, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 20. What are you seeing when you live by faith? The invisible things of him from the creation of the world. When you come into that born-again experience and you believe and you know that the gospel of God is within you and is alive, the invisible things of him from the creation world are clearly seen in your life, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. And he, that's something that he brings up quite a number of times, Paul. Once we know we have no excuse anymore because we're beginning to see a bigger world. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, 
Neither were they thankful for becoming and became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. If you've been around me for the last eight months, we've talked about two subjects here in the church. The definition of faith and imagination. The imagination is the gift of God where he's taken the word from Ecclesiastes and he says, I have put eternity into the heart of man. You can close your eyes. We'll be in Jerusalem in a week and a half. But I can close my eyes right now. You can close your eyes right now and imagine what it is like to walk the Villa Del Rosa or to be at the Wailing Wall. You can actually take your hand if you close your eyes and you can put your hand on that stone and feel that cold stone and see the, see the prayers that are put into the cracks of the wall. When you begin to learn to use the gift of God in your life and you merge it with the gift of faith, the Word of God says that when you're in Christ, that in Christ there is nothing that is impossible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What you see in this world is limitations. And we have excuses that we say, well, that's the reason why these things happening in my life. What he's trying to do is teach us how to get above that. And he's saying here, in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, but because they refused to see what God was trying to show us, we refused. He's saying that we became fools. So from here on, you begin to see Paul begin to show how sin has affected our lives and how sin even came into our lives. Verse 23, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to foot footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use unto that which was against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust toward one another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was met. I want you to listen very carefully now. You and I have been taught in our lives that we should learn to love people but hate the sin. Listen to this again. Verse 25. Oh, verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own flesh, to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. What's going on here? Sin, what we're seeing as sin in the world, is a result of what God has done as he's turned us, the world, over so this is the penalty. When you see homosexuality like it's talking about here and the lusts of the flesh, you're seeing that's the penalty of what? Of not being conscious of God in your life. So it's not being conscious of God in your life that has caused God to allow these circumstances to take place. That's why you see the world in such a mess. What God sees 
He sees the heart of men and women. He sees their heart and he sees them as if his son washed them clean by the blood of the Lamb. God operates in faith as well. He's bringing us to a place where we're going to catch up. But you can refuse that. And that's the only way you don't have access is when you refuse. And when you refuse, what does he do? For this cause, verse 26, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use unto that which was against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving their natural use of the woman. Now, as we read this, I don't want you to make a judgment call on this. Because what Paul's going to begin to do, he's going to start unpacking how this works in our life. And that's where we're going to begin in chapter 2 in a few minutes. <clears throat> Let's go down to verse 28. <clears throat> even, and even as they did not retain God in their knowledge of God, gave them over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You see that? So Paul confirms when we're not conscious of God in our life and we begin to only trust this world, what happens to us? He allows us to be turned over to our affections. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Gosh, we're just talking about what we see all around us anyway. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affections, <clears throat> impeccable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that which commit such things are worthy of death, the word of God says. Not only do the same, but have pleasures in them that do them. This is a reprobate mind. The other thing that we want to talk about for chapter two, of chapter one, is that there's going to be two themes that you're going to see in Romans. One is, is that you're going to see the righteous sinner, and you're going to see the sinner that was unrighteous. And what example, we're going to give you two examples, and we brought them to you last time. One example is, is in the um, is in the story of the uh, <clears throat> a prodigal son. And if you know the story of the prodigal son, you know the one son said, give me all my inheritance to his father. And he went out and he lived a riotous living, you know, sleeping around with the whores. And before you know it, he was doing exactly what it says here in the beginning in, in this part of Romans chapter 1. And he found himself in a terrible state. He was eating the corn husks of the pigs. So he said to himself, I'm going to go back to my father. And it would be better for me to eat with the servants than to be with my father. Well, this is a classic story. We all know it. We all say, we can identify with that son. But then when he gets home, the other son who's coming home, he hears a big party going on. And he asks one of the servants, what happened? And one of the servants says to him, well, your father, your, your brother has come back and the, your father has killed the fatted calf. Put a ring on a finger and put a, put, a, put a coat on him and he's throwing a huge party. You're, and he was so mad. And he says, to the, he says, he goes to his father and says, Father, I have been with you forever, always. I didn't do anything that that did. I did everything right. And so he thought he was righteous 
for being there the whole time. Another story you read about is in Job. Job, in the beginning of Job, you see Job saying, well, you know, he said that his righteousness will prove him out. The only righteousness that will prove you out is the righteousness of Christ. And so he goes through the whole thing, he has to go through all this suffering, and then he has all these friends to come over to him and say to him, well, you must have did something wrong. Let's try to figure out what it was. And his wife goes, curse God and die. Are you ready yet? And if you notice, Satan is around at the beginning of Job, but he's not around at the end of Job. And at the very end of Job, he says, he, after he has to go through all his friends, through his wife, through all the problems that he had to go through, I'm just giving a very quick, him thinking he was righteous. In fact, what he did was, is he was always so afraid that things would go wrong, that they wouldn't, they, that his, even his children were doing, making mistakes, what would he do? He would make sacrifices in order to cover everything. At the end of Job, he says to God, he admits, I knew you by the hearing of my ear, but now I see my eyes are open. So he comes to the realization that the only way that Job could have salvation in his life was by grace. And that he had to be able to come to that place in his life where he realized that God is God. And you and I have to come to that same place in our lives. And so we would come to the conclusion that sacrifices and all these things that we do and, religi and, and religious things that we do would be wrong. And that's even more farther from the truth. Because what happens is he says to, his, to, to Job's friends to go and, and Job would pray for you and, he, and Job has to go pray for his friends and he has to make sacrifice for them. So you would think all that stuff would be thrown away. But no, it's the condition, and that's what I'm trying to get to, it's the condition of the heart and how much you have been conscious of God living in you. And that's what we're going to try to discover between uh, th these chapters, but I believe between chapter 7 and 8 of Romans, you'll begin to see how Paul unpacks this. All right? So let's go to chapter 2 of Romans. And we'll spend some time there. <clears throat> Hopefully getting If you have any questions, feel free to send me a note, as I said, or to message me on, on Facebook. Okay? Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. Whoever thou art that judge, whoso, who, whosoever thou art that judgest, for therein thou judgest thou judgest another, thou condemnest yourself. For thou that judgest does not the same, does the same thing. Verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, according to them which commit such things. Listen to what it says. Therefore, he's saying that, that, O oh man, whatever you judge, thou judgest another, you're condemning yourself. For thou that judgest doest the same. So when you judge another, what you're doing is, is you're actually seeing a mirror image of you in that person. So you're really seeing part of you that's in them. It's like seeing in a mirror. For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And, that, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? See, what Paul is doing, he's setting up the Roman believers. He's setting up you and I. 
so that we can begin to see the truth about ourselves. Verse 3, And thinkest thou this, O man, the judgment, thou judgest them that do such things, and doest the same, and thou shalt escape the judgment of God? <clears throat> or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? If you think about the, 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 um, the scripture that says, there is none righteous. No, not one. And so if you think that you've got it all together and that you are the one that can be able to tell everybody the truth because you have the truth in you, what is he telling us? Just the opposite. In fact, if you have the ability to judge another, it's because you're seeing yourself or you've judged it in them. <clears throat> Verse 5. For after thy hardness and impotent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. Verse 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them who are continuous and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. So he's really telling us the condition of our lives because there's none of us are righteous. None of us have met the test. The only one is your husband, who is your creator, as it says in Isaiah. He is the one. When he lives in you, then your world can begin to change. Because you know that it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. <clears throat> Verse 10, But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. Verse 11. For there is no respect of person with God. So, Paul is not making a distinction between a Jew or a Gentile. He's saying that a Jew and a Gentile are in the same place. Listen to what it says. He's going to start to, to uncover this. Verse 12. For, for many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So, for a religious Jew, you have to have lived the law perfectly. Can you do that? In fact, if, even if you could, which you can't. If you read the Torah, you will find out there is no sacrifice for deliberate sin. You are at the mercy of God. And we read here now about the Gentiles. That means that the only hope they had was the Messiah. And verse 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things which are contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also being bearing witness, and their thoughts, the mean while the mean while accusing or else accusing one another. What he's saying there is, is that even as a Gentile, you know what is right and wrong. Because why? It's in you. Now he's going to start to define what this law is. This is important to understand. <clears throat> 
Verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to, listen to, this, is, this was interesting for me, before it was the gospel of God, now he says, according to my gospel. When you bring the word my in, or I in, he's taking ownership, according to my gospel. What is the gospel? Have you, and it's a question that you have to ask yourself, have you taken ownership of the gospel? And what is the gospel? We know that the gospel is, we read it in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 15. It is the death, it's the burial, and it's the resurrection of Christ. And guess what it is? It's in you. It's in you. As a new creature in Christ, you now have the gift of God when, you, when your eyes have been opened. And when your eyes are opened, you're living in the righteousness of Christ now as opposed to your own. It's the righteous that live by faith. And what is faith? It's believing those things that are not as if they were. It means that now your eyes are open to the invisible things that it were made since the foundation of the world, God begins to open up your eyes. And you begin to see that there is nothing in you that is righteous. The only thing, when you become the temple of God, God dwells in you, and you are conscious of him. That's when he begins to lead you out. That's when he begins to lead you out of the temptations of life. <clears throat> Verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law. You think just because you rest in the law as a Jew that you got it made. And boast of God. In verse 18, And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Thou art confident that thou, that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light unto them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? Listen to this carefully because he's now defining what the law is. Verse 22, Thou that saith a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? When thou abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Thou that maketh thy boast of the law, through breaking of the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you as it is written. Do you recognize those as the ten, part of the Ten Commandments? And the reason why we bring that up is because we have to learn to separate covenant law, this is covenant law, from Levitical law. For those of us who have been studying with us for a long time, some of you may remember that it was Levitical law that was created because of sin. We read about it in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. We read about the fact about the golden calf and all the laws that were created after that because they had broken their marriage vows and God divorced them. That's why the gospel of God is so incredible. He's brought you back. He died for you so that he might bring you into his state and die with him that you might learn to rise with him, as Paul teaches down the road here. And so you become one with Christ, and now it goes from the gospel of God to my gospel, taking ownership of it. And we realize that the covenant law is what God has commanded us to keep. 
It was Levitical law that was only a schoolmaster, as you read in Galatians. A schoolmaster to teach us about the kingdom of God. But God always intended to dwell in your heart. He always intended that you would learn to live by faith. He always intended that grace would be in your life. That's why the book of Job is so powerful. In fact, it was the first book ever written. <clears throat> Verse 25, For circumcision verily profit if, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteous of the law, shall not the uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? For shall and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, it is it is fulfill the law, judge thee by the letter, and the circumcision does transgress the law. That means you can be a circumcised sinner and you can be an uncircumcised sinner, number one. But number two, at Abraham, who was the first to acknowledge the sign of the covenant by circumcision, was made righteous before he was circumcised. So your circumcision does not make you righteous. Just because you have all the outside attributes of being able, and what was it? It was a sign. Just like if you got married and you have a ring, it's a sign of your marriage. If you take the ring off, are you still married? Yes. Because it's a covenant. It's a covenant. It's only a sign of that covenant. It is the circumcision of the heart that God has always wanted. Not that we do things on the outside. Just like we read about in, in the beginning of Romans. That he's opened up our eyes to see what's in the heart. What was, it, what was invisible has become visible. This is the gift of God from your born again experience. So listen to what he says. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. You are a Christian because you were one inwardly. Your circumcision in your life is not because it's outwardly, it's inwardly. Because you have broken your heart to know who your husband is. Who your maker is. You become conscious of him in your life. Verse 29, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision that is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. These whoso praise is not of men, but of God. And so we begin to see how Paul is beginning to unpack where we need to be able to be in our lives as we draw closer to him. So that's why I think Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees. They had all the outside attributes. He said they were like, White sepulchers. They were beautiful on the outside, but inside was death. So tonight, as we finish up chapter 2, let us be reminded that there is nothing in us that is righteous. That we could do nothing to earn it in our lives. To earn salvation to, it is the gospel of God that comes into our heart that leads us into a righteous life, into righteous living. It says in Habakkuk, it says that the righteous will live by faith. And so he's teaching us to live by faith. And I'll give you a, a, one little lesson that, that if you read the epistles, as you read the epistles and you read the gospels about what Jesus did to teach his disciples, and one that always sticks out to me is when Peter was on a boat and a storm comes up and he sees Jesus walking on the water. And you have to ask yourself, what in the world was Jesus teaching his disciples? 
when Jesus, when Paul, when, when, when Peter got up and he said to Jesus, if it's you, Jesus, bid me to come and walk on the water. He was teaching Peter how to live by faith. How to walk in faith. And in walking in faith, we learn how God begins to work in our lives. So the, the action of faith is that he had, when he said, come Peter, he got out of the boat. I don't know if I would have got out of that boat. And he began to walk on water. And when did he stop walking on water? As soon as he saw the circumstances around him were not favorable for walking on water. He began to see the material, three-dimensional world over and above the fourth-dimensional world, which was what Christ is today. And what happened? He yells out, Jesus, save me. And he pulls him out of the water, and immediately he's back in the boat, and Jesus says to him, O oh, thou of little faith. He's exercising our faith through the circumstances of our lives. So, as we begin, we're gonna, we'll, we'll be able to get together next Thursday. I would encourage you to read chapter 3 and go through chapter 4, because really, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 are all connected. Okay? So, praise the Lord. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for uncovering, Lord Jesus, in our lives, your word, and how it works in our lives. And we're asking, Lord, for your continued grace in our lives, that, Lord, you would continue to teach us how to walk by faith, and that, Lord, we would see in our lives that we are unrighteous and we are undeserving totally. But because of your grace, you've lifted us up, you've washed us off, and you've made us whole. We bless you and honor you. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen and amen.